Disclaimer, J.K. Rowling is a girl's best friend. It wasn't quite that easy, but it was still well within Hermione's capabilities. Step 1. Separate pure carbon from charcoal, which was mostly carbon to begin with. This was easy with her elemental filtering spells. This created what she was pretty sure was powdered graphite. Step 2. Use her original magnesium filtering spell as a starting point and create a spell to work in reverse and arrange the carbon atoms back into a crystal structure. She'd already dabbled in this, but she hadn't realized the full potential until now. Step 3. The spell could arrange carbon atoms into the simple tetrahedral arrangement of a diamond crystal without too much trouble, but it needed a macroscopic pattern to follow. Otherwise, unless she could visualize the complete crystal like a transfiguration master, she'd wind up with an amorphous lump of aggregated microcrystals. The solution was runes, and what she would later learn was just a touch of alchemy. She carefully calculated all the dimensions and went back to her mathematical roots, using a ruler and a protractor to draw up an orthographic projection of a simple old single-cut diamond. According to a Muggle library book she picked up, that was the typical Renaissance diamond cut, and it was the simplest cut in common use. Because of the refractive patterns, it would appear black to the eye, but it was good enough to start. Then there were the runes. Runes to anchor the crystal arrangement spell to the lines and make it form into the desired shape as a single crystal. Runes to correct the inevitable slight misalignment in her drawing and make sure the facets follow to the cleavage planes perfectly. Rarely used numerical runes to define the size of the target. Norse had no numbers, so Roman numerals were used by default, which was a pain in the arse. Everything had to be written as ratios. Ugh. She'd have to look into a better system. She also had to evacuate the air around the target, or the nitrogen would get into the crystal structure and turn it yellow. She didn't even know what the oxygen would do. It was messy, overcomplicated, and Ron probably could have done it better, but she wasn't ready to bring anyone else into this. Step 4. Once she had tested all the parts she could, she transferred her paper drawing onto a wood panel and cast the spell at Grimald Place. It worked. The graphite powder swirled around, forming into an octahedral shape. Slowly, it settled, solidified, and changed from a dark matte black to a deep but transparent luster. She picked it up. Carefully, the corners were sharpened to an atom if this had worked right, and wrapped it against the desk. It seemed pretty solid. She tried to scratch it with a knife. The steel wouldn't mark it. It felt unnaturally cool in her hand, revealing the high heat conductivity of diamond. It had worked. It took a week of late nights, research, calculation, and anxiety, but it worked. She could make diamonds by rearranging the atoms in graphite. And it terrified her. Despite her apprehension, she modified her diagram to make the diamond bigger. She needed to prove her point in order to impress upon a certain person how serious this was. It worked again. She sent Dobby with a letter to her parents saying she was working on an urgent project and needed to stay overnight. They weren't happy, but they said it was alright if she didn't make it a habit. She modified her diagram to add more facets to make a Mazarin cut. It worked again, producing a diamond that looked much brighter than the single cut. Hermione barely made it to Honeydukes before they closed. By the time she got into the castle, it was past curfew. She used the Mathemagician's map to evade the patrols, Umbridge, and Peeves, and made it to the door of the one person whose combined wisdom, magical knowledge, and discretion she trusted the most. Septima Vector was already in her night clothes, ready to turn in early, when the chime sounded on her door. Fortunately, it wasn't the funeral march she had arranged for Umbridge's approach, but she was still worried when she heard the chime to the tune of the hymn, This is my father's world, which she had selected not for the religious reference, but because it contained the phrase, Music of the Spheres. It was Hermione who was coming to her in the dead of night. Septima rushed to the portrait hole and opened it. Her concern jumped when she saw Hermione standing outside, looking pale and scared. Hermione, what is it? 
she whispered. "'You're not to be seen with me?' "'I know, but I had to talk to you,' Hermione whispered back. "'It couldn't wait. Can I come in? There's a prefect patrol coming this way.' She held up her map. "'Of course. Quickly, quickly,' Septima rushed inside. "'Tea?' Y "'Yes, please. Chamomile, if you have it.' Septima put the tea on and joined Hermione in the sitting room. "'Hermione, excuse me, but you look awful. What's wrong? Did something happen to your parents?' She shook her head. "'No, they're fine. It's about my research.' "'And it couldn't wait till morning? Or the next Hogsmeade visit?' "'I... well, I suppose it could have, but I was freaking out. I'm sorry for disturbing you so late.' "'It's okay, Hermione. It's good to see you. But, please, what did you find that scared you enough to risk coming here after hours just to talk to me?' "'I think I just broke the magical world's economy.' Septima stared at her in bewilderment. The only sound in the apartment was the rising whistle of the teacup a couple of minutes later. Septima? Hermione asked. She waved her wand and summoned the tea kettle to the sitting room herself. Septima? she repeated. Theoretically, or did you actually do it? Septima said. Theoretically. Oh, good, she sighed with relief. If you actually broke the magical world's economy, the goblins would kill you, literally. Hermione shuddered. She'd heard horror stories of the goblins, and not just from Professor Ben's class. They and the other syndicates around the world guarded their monopoly on magical currency, jealously. I don't want to cause any trouble, she said. It's just that it was so easy. Once I realized it was possible, I figured out how to do it in a week. Septima knew well that what took Hermione a week could be something other Arithmancers might never even think of in their lives, but still this sounded extreme even for her. Hermione, what do you think you can do that would break the economy? She reached into her bag, pulled out a gleaming rock the size of a golf ball, and placed it on the coffee table. I made this. Septima picked the rock up and examined it. She knew what it looked like. But it couldn't be, could it? Hermione, is this... What is this? She asked. As of right now, that is the world's largest flawless cut diamond. It's 312 carats, completely colorless, perfectly cut, and flawless down to the molecular level. She stared in confusion again. I, I don't understand, Hermione. I've heard of people transfiguring things into the illusion of precious stones, but it takes a true master to visualize them, and they don't stand up to cursory inspection. I don't understand what you did here. Hermione shot her a challenging look. Try to untransfigure it. She waved her wand and cast, Reparifarge! But nothing happened. She tried, Finite incantatum! Also, to no effect. She then began trying stronger untransfiguration spells. Spells that were reserved specifically for otherwise permanent transfigurations. Transfigurations of objects to similar objects that would last longer than very different ones. Transfigurations with various fixing spells and other enchantments to make them more magic resistant. Botched transfigurations that could be very hard to reverse. Any transfiguration expert would have a whole litany of spells on hand in case of emergencies. None of them had any visible effect on the diamond. What did you do to this? Those are all the spells I know. You can wake Professor McGonagall if you want, but I'll save you the time, Hermione said. It's not transfigured. It's not transfigured? It's made from a pile of graphite. I've rearranged the atoms. Septima's eyes grew to the size of saucers, staring at the giant diamond. Oh, Merlin's hairy ass. Yeah, now you know how I feel. I mean, this is... The greatest alchemists in the world could spend their careers on this. It, it shouldn't be possible. With alchemy, I'm sure it's not. But a diamond is just carbon atoms in a certain pattern. And there are plenty of charms to arrange things in a certain pattern. I've already been using them for my elemental filtering spells and didn't realize it. That's why it was so easy. But those charms couldn't have made a perfect crystal like this, though, Septima insisted. 
"I probably could have made something close just by visualizing," Hermione said. "But I didn't. I used this." She reached into her bag again and pulled out the carved wood panel she had used to make the diamond. Septima examined the panel carefully. "'So it is alchemy,' she said. "'I wouldn't know. "'It is. "'Runic diagrams like this are exactly the kind of things alchemists use. "'But it's way different from any alchemy I've ever seen. "'I don't even know what it would do in the field.' "'But I don't need it, Septima,' she said. "'I need the diagram to make a flawless cut diamond, "'but I don't need it to make diamond dust.' I could turn glass into quartz, chalk into gypsum. I can shape metals without melting them. And I haven't even tried covalent molecules yet, all without those diagrams. My God, Hermione, do you know what this means? This is a whole new field of magic you're talking about. I don't think that's happened this century. I know, but trust me, I don't intend on publishing this any time soon. Do you know what this could do to the magical economy? I'm not sure you do. Hermione frowned. What do you mean, Septima? I can do the maths. That diamond you're holding is worth hundreds of thousands of gallons by itself. Give me another week, and I can make one that's worth more than the Malfoys. A month if I could do it without flooding the muggle market, and I could make enough money to buy and sell the ministry outright. No, you couldn't, Septima said automatically. Huh? Excuse me. Sometimes I forget what you do and don't know as a muggle-born. Rather, you could, but the goblins wouldn't let you convert that much money to gallons. They're shrewd, Hermione. They know there's always a chance some muggle billionaire could have a magical child and flood the magical economy with gold. So they limit the amount of money you can convert to gallons each year. Oh! It seemed so obvious when she put it that way. She'd never even considered that before. If Bill Gates happened to have a magical child, a one in 50,000 chance, so it was tiny, but worth considering, he might be able to buy up the entire magical world if they let him. Of course, the goblins would have thought about that. That, that actually makes me feel quite a bit better, she said. But what about selling in gallons directly? I could sell that or several smaller diamonds in the magical world and tip the economy on its head. No good. There's a treaty between the Ministry and the Goblins that sets it up so that the bank fees go higher and higher the more money changes hands. It doesn't affect you unless you're rich like most of the Wizengamont, but it's the same problem. There are plenty of ways a muggle billionaire could destabilize the magical economy from the inside. Granted, if it were only diamonds, the rest of the market would stabilize soon enough, but they wouldn't appreciate such a shock to the system. If you tried it, they'd tie you up in enough red tape that you couldn't make any more money than you could converting it from pounds— and worse, they would make the rest of your life a lot harder, too. So if I, hypothetically, wanted to do something with this, I'd have to restrain myself? Septima's face darkened. Hermione, if you want my advice, don't do anything with it at all. Probably destroy this diamond if you can remake it so easily. If the goblins find out you can make these things, they'll be watching you like a hawk. If you disrupt the magical markets, they'll bring their whole financial apparatus to bear to force you into an exclusivity contract. And if you disrupt the muggle markets, they'll report you for violating the statute of secrecy. Hermione gulped and nodded firmly. I understand, Septima, but what if the muggles can already do this? Can they? she said with wide eyes. Not that one, no, she motioned to the giant diamond. But they can make synthetic diamonds, and I'd bet good money they'll be able to replicate that within a few decades. That shock to the system is coming whether the goblins like it or not. Oh dear, that could get ugly. She sighed heavily. I worry about you, Hermione. Between the war and the stuff you get up to, I'm worried you're going to bite off more than you can chew. I know, and I can promise I'll be careful. I just don't want to let an opportunity like this go if I can help it. With the war going on, I'm afraid I might need it soon enough. Septima sat silently, gazing at the huge diamond. She didn't like to think about such things. Hermione was right. As a muggle-born, she needed all the help she could get in this war, and an independent source of wealth would be a big help. But how she wanted to go about doing it? It struck her as a desperate move, 
that or it was just her boundless eagerness getting the best of her. I'm not going to convince you to back off from this, am I? she said. I wouldn't say that, Septima. I don't want to bring any more trouble on myself, but if there's any way I can pull this off... She sighed again. I don't know for sure, but if you want to even try, there are two things you need to do. First, you need to read the laws on doing business in the muggle world carefully. You don't want to make any mistakes there. And second, you need to apply for an alchemist's license immediately. You may not think this is alchemy, but it really is. That will protect you from legal action from the goblins if you stay within the restrictions. Hermione frowned. But with the ministry the way it is, there's no way they'd give me a license. They will for a student. Here's what you need to do. Tell Professor Slughorn that you want to take Professor Dumbledore's alchemy class next year and have him add it to your official education plan. That will get you a student permit. Then ask Dumbledore to sign it for you now instead of next autumn. He seems to like you. That'll probably work. Hermione considered this. She hadn't been planning on telling Dumbledore about this new skill of hers. It was the sort of thing she'd rather keep from someone like him. But she supposed she could tell him the minimum it took to convince him, since then she'd be in business, literally. And then maybe she could buy the twins a nice graduation present. Thank you, she nodded. And thank you for talking to me. I was panicking a little bit. I'm always happy to help. It's after curfew, though. Can you get out of here without getting caught? Uh, no, she admitted. I had a way in, but I can't get out until morning. Where are you going to sleep? That secret room I told you about. I've done it before. I... you could stay here for the night. I could transfigure the sofa into a bed. That's very kind of you, Septima, but I wouldn't want to impose. I can get everything I need there. All right, then. Don't tell anyone, but I saw the interview in the Quibbler. It was very good. Thank you. You didn't have any trouble for it, did you? Umbridge said something about sedition. I might have had, but Cedric warned me, and I had Dobby take a letter to an aura I know to take care of anything she tried. Septima was clearly relieved by that. How is Cedric doing? Everything was shocked when he left. Rough, from what I hear, Hermione said sadly. The last I heard, he had a tutor, but his dad's making him work for the tuition. They apparently had a pretty big argument over it. I'm not surprised, knowing Amos Diggory. I'm afraid more and more of us are starting to get the same idea this week, though. Students and teachers. I don't know if you heard. Professor Trelawney was fired this week. Hermione's eyes widened. No, I didn't. What happened? Well, Umbridge decided she wasn't a very good teacher, which, unfortunately, I have to agree with. I was afraid your old roommates, Brown and Pattle, were going to snap and curse Umbridge. But Dumbledore insisted Trelawney stay in the castle, so she's not out on the street. And what happened after that was great. He went out to the Forbidden Forest and hired a centaur to replace her. You should have seen Umbridge's face. Hermione laughed loudly at the thought. With Umbridge's attitude towards half-breeds, she must have practically had an aneurysm after that. Her fears assaged, she used her map to sneak up to the room of requirement and slept in the replica of her bedroom at home until morning. Just before she went to sleep, she had a thought. Mum and Dad's 25th is coming up next week. I should make them something nice, too. Hermione went to a different jeweler this time, a more upscale one. It wouldn't do to have the old jeweler, who thought she was a simple local comprehensive student, see her like this. She wore her best, most businesslike muggle clothes, even her hated high heels, and adopted the most poised stance she could before she walked to the shop from Grimald Place on Monday. This jeweler, a Mr. Christopher, looked much more interested than the last one she'd visited, no doubt recognizing the greater wealth she was projecting today. "'Good afternoon, miss. How may I help you?' he greeted her. Hermione had thought long and hard over the weekend about how to approach this. She handed over an official-looking business card she made on her computer. "'Good afternoon, Mr. Christopher,' she said. "'I represent a new commercial gemological lab looking to get started in the area, and we want to start doing business with a few local jewelers. Our specialty is in manufacture.' Man "'Manufacture?' Mr. Christopher said, narrowing his eyes in confusion. "'Synthetic gems. Do you deal in them?' 
A little, Miss Grant, he said, reading the card. We try to keep to the natural ones, mostly. Prestige, you know. Of course, but you may change your mind when you see our products, Hermione replied. Mind you, we're just in the testing stages right now, not quite ready to go public, but we needed to make some sample pieces unexpectedly, and we don't have anyone on staff who can set them yet. We were hoping you would be able to set a few small pieces quickly. Oddly, she thought, all of that was basically true. Uh, what kind of pieces? I have some empty settings in the back. Mr. Christopher showed Hermione a variety of pieces. She quickly picked out a three-stone anniversary setting for her mum and a pair of gold cufflinks designed for a single diamond stud for her dad, all in 18-karat gold. He then asked her what she wanted them set with, and she pulled out a small pouch from which she tipped out six flawless, one-carat, brilliant-cut diamonds. It was a couple of steps up from the Mazarin cut to the 58 facets and a circular perimeter of the round, brilliant cut, but she'd managed to put it together over the weekend. Mr. Christopher was awed when he looked at them through his loop. Miss Grant, these are astonishing. I don't think I've ever seen synthetic gems this quality before. Uh, forgive me, but these are perfectly legitimate? Naturally, I have the full documentation here. She pulled out some papers from her handbag, which she had also drawn up over the weekend based on some documents she had cajoled her other jeweler into showing her. Mr. Christopher looked them over with a critical eye, but he soon accepted them, though he asked her, "'Aren't you a bit young to be working for such a prestigious laboratory?' "'I finished school early,' she said, which was almost true. "'I'm just an intern right now, but the director trusts me with this.' "'Of course, Miss Grant. So you want five diamonds in these three settings. What about the sixth one?' "'Your payment, Mr. Christopher,' he raised his eyebrows in surprise. "'You'll want to hold on to it until we go public. It'll be worth more then.' "'Well, it's already worth more than the settings, Miss Grant. I'll have to give you some change.' "'Whatever you think is fair, Mr. Christopher. Our only request is that when you do set it, you put a small engraving on the piece, a lowercase gamma.' "'A lowercase gamma?' "'A serial number. Our name is Archimedes Jewelers.' "'Ah, of course. When do you want to pick them up?' "'Thursday morning, if you can have them by then.' "'Certainly. Let's get them written up.' They quickly made a deal, and a few days later, Hermione had her parents' anniversary gifts in hand. In the meantime, she had stopped by Gringotts and bought some gold, silver, and platinum bullion with her change. That gave her a chance to adapt and practice her atomic rearrangement spells for metalworking and alloying, something she'd eventually want for the more refractory metals. She also successfully did three small engravings on the pieces she'd had set a lowercase alpha on her mum's ring, and a lowercase beta on each of her dad's cufflinks, and she was ready to go. As avid Shakespeare fans, what other day could Daniel and Emma Granger have married on than the Ides of March? Well, possibly St. Crispin's Day, but after several of their friends had to look up when St. Crispin's Day was, the 25th of October, they went with the more memorable date. This year was their silver anniversary, but Hermione had a couple of other materials in mind for them. She felt bad that they couldn't take a nice week-long holiday this year since she was unexpectedly staying at home, and they were worrying about her part in the war, so she wanted to do something special for them. She decided to get up early and make them breakfast in bed. Not that she was a fantastic cook, but she did know how to fry an egg. She politely asked Dobby not to help as a sign of respect. As she hoped, it made an impression. This is wonderful, Hermione, Mum said. What brought this about? I just wanted to show you how much I appreciate you two, she said. All the ways you've supported me over the past five years and everything. And since you couldn't go on holiday this year, I wanted to do something to make it up to you. Ah, you didn't have to do anything for us, Hermione, but this is very thoughtful just the same. Seems like a good way to start our anniversary to me, Dad agreed. And we took the day off, so there's no rush for change. I'd offer to soundproof your room, too, but, you know, ministry interference. Hermione, Mum said, blushing bright red. Come on, Mum. It's not like I haven't heard you two before. Don't worry. I'll just put on some music. You, Missy, are getting too cheeky for your own good. It comes from having George as a boyfriend, I think. Anyway, when you're done with breakfast, I have your presents for you. 
You didn't have to buy us anything, Dad. Hermione grinned. They didn't cost me a penny, Dad. In fact, I actually made some money on the deal. That piqued her parents' curiosity. She could tell they were wondering what she was talking about all through breakfast, and when they were done, she didn't think they could have looked more shocked when they opened their gifts. Hermione, they're beautiful, Mum gasped. Is this what you've been working on the past two weeks? Some of it. I got the settings done at a jeweler's in London, though. But these can't be real diamonds, can they? Dad said, examining the cufflinks closely. Oh, they are, Dad. They can't be, though. These must have cost thousands of pounds. You're not making that much money, are you? Nope, I told you they didn't cost a penny. Mum gave her a stern look. Hermione, what did you do? She smiled again. I made them. Mum's mouth dropped open. You made them? She thought for a moment. Didn't you tell us that magic can't create money? In simple terms, yes. But diamonds aren't really money. They're just carbon, and I've been manipulating elements for over a year. Their eyes widened. Then you could make more? Dad asked. Well, yes, but I can't get too far into it yet. There's a lot of paperwork involved to make sure it's all above board. Dad just shook his head. Hermione, you are an amazing young woman, and these are wonderful presents. Thank you. Anything for you two. Have fun today. She didn't mention the protein charms she'd added to the jewelry, connected to a gold charm she'd attached to her gallon necklace. She'd save that in case of an emergency. She left her parents to themselves while she got back to work, and her next project. She was already thinking of a different form of carbon that muggle scientists had been examining recently, a form that some said was supposed to be more than a hundred times stronger than steel. So, Sinestra got us doing a big project on that comet whose name I can't pronounce, Harry said in the mirror. Hyakutake, Harry, Hermione told him. It's Japanese. Yeah, that one. She rolled her eyes. I've been wanting to follow it more closely, too, but I just haven't had time. How is it from the castle? It's neat. You can't see a whole lot without the night vision potion, though. Consider yourself lucky you're in Scotland. I asked Professor Slughorn if we could make that potion, but he said the city lights are too bright for it to be useful. Oh, too bad. Hey, speaking of the comet, Lavender finally asked to join the DA. What? Hermione said, in confusion. How is that related? Apparently, Ferenz said that the comet means war is coming, and she freaked out about it. Hermione smacked her forehead. You're telling me she wouldn't believe Dumbledore, the boy who lived, and her best friend, but she'll believe her horoscope? Harry shrugged his shoulders. Ah, I'd like to give her peace of my mind, but the more people we convince, the better. I suppose it doesn't much matter how she came to it. Well, if you're okay with her, bring up the contract so she can sign it. And there was one other thing, too. Ginny keeps bugging me to ask if you and Cedric can put out another interview about Umbridge and her quills. Merlin's pants! I completely forgot about that! She exclaimed. Tell her I'm sorry. I've been busy with... She stopped, not quite ready to talk about that. Well, I had some problems that were legitimately worrying me, and I had to take care of them. I'll write to Luna's dad and Rita Skeeta, but it's probably too late for this month's issue. We'll have to shoot for late April. Harry sighed, knowing that Ginny would be unhappy about that. Well, it's better than nothing, he said. Carbon nanotubes, atom-thin sheets of graphite rolled into tubes only a few nanometers wide, were supposed to be the strongest material ever discovered, though Hermione didn't know how they would measure up against enchanted weapons or unbreakability charms. Creating individual nanotubes was easy enough, or at least she thought it was. She couldn't actually see them. But it only took a different pattern of runes and diagrams to shape the molecular structure. Producing useful fibers from them was harder. She eventually fell back on her experience working with cloth, spinning the nanotubes into nano-yarn and the nano-yarn into nano-rope. Eventually, she made enough layers that she had macroscopic fibers she could actually work with. She put them on a force gauge to test their tensile strength against steel wire, and she found that, while they weren't as hundred times stronger than steel, they were easily ten times stronger. 
Of course, while it would be a scientific marvel, even by muggle standards, by itself, ultra-strong rope wasn't that interesting. What did interest Hermione, however, was whether she could make more solid objects from carbon nanotubes. She had read the legends of goblin-made swords and shields in her search for the weapon that might be in the Department of Mysteries. They were said to be unbreakable, incorruptible, and the blades able to cleave through flesh and bone like a knife through butter. She wasn't sure she believed it, but she remembered Harry driving the sword of Gryffindor straight through the extra-tough skull of a basilisk in second year. A blade as sharp and strong as one made out of carbon nanotubes might be able to equal that feat. Better yet, a shield made from the material would be lightweight, yet able to block powerful curses that would blast through a wall. The trouble was how to harden the flexible fibers into a blade or shield. She tried weaving the nanotubes into nano cloth. She tried arranging them in a three-dimensional lattice. Neither worked, but after two weeks of theoretical work and the limited experimentation she could do at headquarters, she found the solution. It was crude, and it wasn't easy, but it did work. She had to use her atomic rearrangement spells combined with raw visualization, picturing adjacent nanotubes bonding with one another. She only had a razor blade sized chunk of hardened nanotubes on her first attempt, but not even a diamond would scratch it. There was just one problem. She realized at once that a full-sized blade would be far too light. It took sharpness and weight to cleave through flesh and bone, if that was truly her desire. If she wanted this to work, any blade she created would need more ballast. The solution to that, however, was obvious after a little thought. It was the same thing she'd been trying to work with for the past year. Once a curiosity, but now an essential. Tungsten the densest metal she could collect in significant amounts. Well, that is, if she had access to soil where she could cast the spells to filter tungsten out of it without raising red flags at the ministry. The stuff wasn't cheap, after all. She couldn't do it at home, and there was no yard at Grimald Place. What she needed was a large expanse of soil in a magical area where she could move about without being seen, and that really only left one option. Happy birthday, George! If Hermione was exploiting her parents' leniency a bit to sneak into Hogwarts to visit her boyfriend on his birthday, she wasn't too ashamed, since there was a good cause tied into it. Hermione! Hmm, it's so good to see you, George said, kissing her deeply. Oh, you, you too, George, Hermione said between kisses. She'd told Dobby to tell George to meet her in the room of requirement tonight, and his eagerness showed. Their meeting quickly devolved into a snogging session more heated than any they had had before, to the point that she had to slow them down before his hormones, or hers, to be honest, got the better of them. It was just so nice to be able to relax and unwind like this for a while, but she had work to do. "'Don't you want me to give you your birthday present?' she said breathlessly. "'This seems like a pretty good present already,' George mumbled as he tried to kiss his way down her neck. "'This isn't the present.' This is just a bonus. Oh, and what did you get me? he asked. A request. He pulled back and stared at her. A request? I want you and Fred to sneak me into the Forbidden Forest. I can't believe you, little Miss Perfect, would want to sneak into the Forbidden Forest, Fred said as they crept through the grounds. I guess I've been a good influence on Hermione, Freddy. George needled his twin. Oi, we both been corrupting Hermione since long before you were dating, Fred said. Then he glanced at Hermione. Heck of a date, though. He affected a French accent and said, So what will your pleasure be, Mademoiselle Granger? Thestral paddock? Centaur colony? There's a rumor there's a nest of giant spiders in here, but we've never been that deep, George added. No, no, nothing like that, she said. Just far enough from the edge that they can't see us from the castle. Uh, I'm sorry, George, but this is kind of a working date. I need several pounds of tungsten, and the easiest way for me to get it is to filter it from a couple thousand cubic meters of soil. I hope you don't mind being my bodyguards for the night. Not at all, my lovely girlfriend, George said. It's worth it to see you flouting the rules so blatantly. Well, it's for a good cause, you know, defense, she said. I just needed a large patch of soil to do it. She drew her wand and started casting. 
Filtro trena tungsten. Filtro trena tungsten. Filtro trena tungsten. A fine mist of metallic powder lifted up from the ground and flew into her old jam jar. Tungsten was so dense that it would hold more than enough for her purposes. But if she didn't have time today, she hoped she would be able to come back some other time for more. So, just a bunch of this? Fred asked. Yes, I need it for ballast, she explained. I've been on an artifact creation kick lately. I'll show you at the end of the year. I can't wait, George said. They chatted about the goings-on at the castle for a while. Since the Quibbler interview, things had been surprisingly quiet. Luna had handled her week's detention surprisingly well, Hermione knew, and though she now had a scarred hand to match her own, the twins thought she seemed as carefree as ever. Indeed, Ginny had taken it harder, crying and hugging her friend as she treated and bandaged her wounds. Hermione hadn't known they were that close, even after knowing them for years, but she could see how Ginny would be defensive of the little blonde girl. George assured her that he and Fred weren't planning on leaving Hogwarts any time soon, although they undermined themselves by saying that they were saving up their stuff for an epic prank, just in case. Hermione advised them to leave it for an emergency. The DA was going well, but she knew that already. Cho, however, was very happy that Hermione was able to sneak Cedric back into the castle to see her. Hermione fervently hoped that things would stay that way until they managed to get rid of Umbridge. The jam jar was growing heavy in her hand when the trio heard hoofbeats. At once, Fred and George each grabbed one of her shoulders and pulled her close to them, drawing their wands. "'What is it?' she asked. "'Shush, Senta, Fred whispered. "'Hopefully it's just one,' George said. "'They don't normally come this close.' "'Hagrid says they've been antsy this year. "'Just stay calm, and whatever you do, be respectful.' The hoofbeats slowed, and a tall, multi-limbed creature stepped out of the trees in front of them. He had a man's torso, standing high above them, bare-chested and heavily muscled. He had a goat-like beard and a flowing black mane of hair down his neck, and Hermione thought he would have been very attractive if he didn't have four legs, but his waist ended at the shoulders of a sleek, black equine body. More to the point, he looked angry and had a bow and arrows slung across his back. Hermione tensed. She thought her basilisk skin coat would probably protect her from arrows, but that wouldn't help George or Fred. Humans, the centaur said in a nasty voice. You should not be here. You are not welcome in our forest. Their forest, Hermione thought. Before she could react, Fred edged forward with a slight bow and said, uh, Now, I'm sure this is just a misunderstanding, Mr. I am Bane, and you are the Brothers Weasley. You have been an annoyance in our lands for too long. He stopped and seemed to notice Hermione for the first time. Who is this female? He demanded. Hermione pushed her indignation down. My name is Hermione Granger, uh, Bane. We didn't mean to intrude. I was under the impression that the forest was school property. Our laws are not human laws, Hermione Granger. This forest is reserved for our herd, Bane said. His voice darkened, and he continued. And our hospitality for you humans has run out of late. Bane, we have always respected your territory, George said. He still sounded confident, but Hermione could feel his arm shaking. But Hagrid says Hogwarts has rights to use the forest as far as the Thestral paddock. Bane whinnied in protest and stepped forward menacingly. Hagrid! That human is especially unwelcome after what he has done! Which we had nothing to do with, Fred said quickly though Hermione didn't even know what it was about. "'Then what are you doing here?' the centaur said. The twins glanced at Hermione, and she answered in a small voice, "'I'm filtering tungsten from the soil.' "'I do not know this tungsten,' Bane said suspiciously. "'It's a heavy metal, a trace mineral,' she explained. "'It's not harmful to remove it. If anything, it will help the soil. We humans use it for its weight.' It's as heavy as gold and much more common. And can you obtain it elsewhere? Well, yes, but... Then do so, Bane roared. This forest is not for your use. Leave now and be thankful we do not harm foals. Hermione stood stiffly. She tried to think of something else to say, but Bane's hand was twitching toward his bow, and George and Fred picked her up by her arms and whisked her away. 
Sorry to bother you. We'll be going now, then, they called behind them. Phew, that was close, George said when they got to the edge of the trees. They really are getting antsy. Not the word I would have used, Hermione said shakily. Well, most of them are nicer than Bane there, Fred explained. Still, if they're shutting us out of the whole forest, Dumbledore's not going to like that. Too bad they can't all be more like Ferenz, eh? said George. He seems like a good bloke. Of course, he also had hoof prints on his chest from when they kicked him out of the herd. Hermione's eyes widened. She hadn't known the centaurs would be that brutal to one of their own, although perhaps she should have expected something like it, given the mythological stories about them. What did Hagrid do? She changed the subject. Helped Ferenz get away from the herd without getting killed, said Fred. They say he's a traitor, I guess. Sorry this didn't go so well, George said. Did you get enough tungsten? Not quite as much as I wanted, but it'll do. That's good. I was scared for you out there. She shook her head. I'm wearing my basilisk skin coat. If all he had was that bow and arrow... George hushed her, casting a furtive glance around. They're herd animals, he whispered. There could be others around. Oh. Yeah, this is getting out of our depth, Fred agreed. Let's just get back without getting caught. When they returned to the castle, they almost made it to the secret passage unseen. But as Hermione watched the math magician's map, she unfortunately found they were being maneuvered to run into someone by the patrols. Fortunately, that someone was Albus Dumbledore. Good evening, Mrs. Weasley, he said when he stepped from behind the corner. Good evening, Headmaster, George and Fred said, trying too hard to sound innocent. It appears as if you had had an eventful day, he continued, clearly knowing exactly what they'd been up to. You had best return to your dorms quickly. It's nearly curfew. Miss Granger, I'm glad I caught you. I should very much like you to join me in my office at nine o'clock on Saturday morning. I trust you can make it without being seen? Um, of course, Professor. I'll see you then. Dumbledore went on his way, leaving her to wonder what new development was coming.